Hello, my name is Leslie Grigsby. I'm the Senior Curator of Ceramics and Glass at Winterthur Museum, Garden and Library, which is located not far from Wilmington, Delaware. Also, I am the daughter of two doctors who happened to take an interest in the history of medicine and collected ceramic objects and others that were related to that history. Today, I thought we might take a look at a few different examples of such wares. First, I'll show you a piece that happens to have come from my parents' collection. This is a type of dry drug jar from Italy in the 1600s, and it's in a form that's known as an albarello form. We'll talk about that a little more later. Another example here is a wet drug jar. You can see the spout on it, and it's inscribed Olio Volpino, and if we look around, you can see the back of it. It's had a hard life, but it was used and, and I love it. So I'm going to dive right in. The objects that we'll be looking at today are from the Winterthur collection, unless you see a note below it that is referring to another collection. Otherwise, assume it is in the Winterthur collection place. Won't surprise you that I decided to name this talk To Your Health. Seems appropriate in a time of pandemic. I'm beginning with a print that was created in the late 1700s, but was inspired by a painting that dated over a century earlier. This shows a pharmacist or a doctor who is holding up a glass container that has a liquid in it. Almost certainly, since this is a satirical print, um, the liquid that he's looking at is urine, which could be from the woman near him or the woman who's peeking around the corner from the door. And he is looking to try and determine whether or not she might be pregnant. He also sometimes, uh, looking at a liquid like this, might have been an attempt to figure out if she had some sort of a social disease. It is a satirical print. The ceramics and glass that you see down on the floor in this view are all for different kinds of medicines. And those at the lower right are ceramic vessels that have little sort of cloth-like little hats on top. Actually, these probably were made of parchment or of, um, could be greased paper or um, leather. And you would soak these and then tie them tightly around the wasted rim of the vessel. And when that dried, it created a type of lid that could be snapped on and off. Good way to protect the containers, I mean the contents. And there's also a cork in one of the wet drug jars. It's uh, stuck in the spout to help protect the contents. This is that Olio Volpino jar that we saw a moment ago. It is a wet drug jar, again with the spout. And it dates probably to the 1500s, very late 1500s or early 1600s, and was made in Italy. Olio Volpino, or oil of fox, was prepared by boiling fox flesh from which you would remove the bones. You would be boiling it in olive oil and flavoring the product with, for example, dill seeds or thyme. There were quite a few different recipes for this. And this would then be poured out and then rubbed onto your chest to try and help ease respiratory illnesses. And you also could put it on your joints to try and reduce the pain from gout, aging, or other types of trauma to the body. Another jar we see here is in Chinese export porcelain, quite an elegant ware. And this would originally have had a lid on it it bears the symbols that refer to the Order of St. Augustine, a religious group who had missions in Macau, not too far from Hong Kong, and um, in Mexico from the late 1500s on. This type of ware was quite elegant and it bears the designs that would have been fashionable on Chinese export porcelain of the time. Almost certainly the order was acquiring sets of jars with similar decoration, perhaps in a couple different shapes. We see this concept exemplified here at the Hospital Tavera, which is located in Toledo in Spain. And there are rows and rows of wonderful drug jars here, some of them in sets. If we look at the group at the top, we can see sort of armorial or coats of arms uh, devices that ornament these pieces and refer to the order that was in control of the hospital or, or um, the medical and hospitality facility of this religious group. 
the lower part of the far left jar on the top of the screen does have the name of a type of medicine on it, but the jars to its right have at that lower area just blank spaces where you could take a grease pencil and write on the name of a medicine, or you might stick on a um, piece of paper that had the name of the medicine. You can see some of those types of stickers have been applied at jaunty angles onto the vessels at the top of the screen. That tall, wasted form that we just saw from Spain ultimately was copying a jar form that came from the Near East. It had been used for many, many centuries there, and wares, frit wares of this form were being exported from areas like Iran all around the Mediterranean and were um, being copied in the wares of the countries that were importing the, wares, uh, the um, Iranian objects. For example, at the right, we can see a Spanish jar that maybe dates to right around 1700, could be a little later than that. And that region, of course, had been controlled by the Near East for a couple centuries. Not surprising that the design would hold on there. Another one of these sort of Alberello forms, to use the Italian name, is shown here. This is a much larger vessel that has a coat of arms on it that perhaps refers to a religious order or maybe more likely could refer to a um, wealthy family, a noble family in Europe. This example was made in Italy in the latter part of the 1600s. Looking at another print, this time a later one, we see a view that is a satirical scene taking place in London. It's from William Hogarth's Marriage a la Mode which was a series of images that told the story of a sort of wild young couple who was partying and traveling around and doing not particularly conservative things in London in the mid 18th century. On the right, we see detailed views showing the doctor or pharmacist. And at the extreme right, we can see a cabinet that has a group of drug jars at the top and then different types of drawers at the lower portion that have ribbons, which were inscribed with different medicine names. That same type of pharmacy would exist over here in America. And the upper view here is the Pastor Galt apothecary shop in Williamsburg, Virginia, um, down in colonial Williamsburg. And they've excavated fragments of drug jars, English ones, that um, have been duplicated here in intact examples. They're uh, arranged in rows above those drawers with medicine names on them. The lower part of the screen is a view from, uh, of some objects from the 1752 pharmacy in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. If we go to Winterthur's collection, we see here a type of wet drug jar that dates to the early part of the 1700s, was made in England, and it would have been used to contain a type of syrup that was made with white rhubarb um, that was sort of cooked with dissolved sugar. And this sweet tasting, probably pretty enjoyable type of medicine would have been given to children to treat constipation. Another jar from the collection is this one, which has T-D-E-A-G-A-R on it. And we think that the agar inscription may be an abbreviation for the agaricus mushroom. Um, Perhaps this was a type of tablet that was made from that mushroom. And it was a type of drug that was used over the centuries to attempt to treat cancer. I don't know how well it worked, but it was a popular drug. Another example here, another dry drug jar, was perhaps to hold a mixture that was related to elixir stomachicum or stomachicum, I'm not sure of the pronunciation. And one recipe for it from the early 1700s says you take spirit of wine, oil of salt, and you mix them. You then add black pepper, grains of paradise, whatever that is, cubebs, winter's cinnamon, and cochineal, which was a type of bug that you squished up. You let it sit in a gentle heat for a month, and then you shake the glass once or twice a day. Then you let it settle in a cold place. Once it has settled, you decant that clear liquid from the upper portion into a stoppered glass bottle and dispose of the residue from the bottom. This was used 
to treat stomach ailments. Little ointment pots were very popular. We see them at the top of the screen. You would bring them home um, from the pharmacy, much like we would bring our medicines home today. At the bottom of the screen is an example that happens to bear an inscription that says pomade divine. This is in reference to divine pomade that you would rub on your head to try and encourage hair to grow or maybe to make your hair look a little bit better. In 1765 in London, there's a reference to, that is posted by a um, perfumer. It, he says, a bear is to be slain at our sanguines, that perfumer I mentioned, who is located in London. Where ladies or gentlemen may have any quantity of fat they please, cut off the bear's back before their face at two shillings an ounce. After which time, about three days, it will be melted and put into pots for sale. Not sure that I approve of the way they're getting this medicine, but times were different then, and the idea of animal rights, of course, was extremely different. Another medical-related object we see here is often referred to as an apothecary or pill tile or pill slab. It has two holes at the top where you could hang it on the wall, and it bears the arms of the worshipful London Society of Apothecaries, which became independent around uh, 1617. Before that time, it had been part of the Bar Barbers and Surgeons Company. This type of object would be laid flat on a tabletop, for example, and you would take a thick paste that you had prepared previously and roll it out into a snake and then cut it to form your different individual pills that you could then let dry and dispense. Now, Originally, as I said, this was part of the company of barbers and surgeons. The, and for a long time, barbers would continue to do certain types of medical work as they traveled around um, and were providing services, including giving you a shave and doing your hair or helping to prepare your wig. Here we see a satirical image that's showing the village barber. This is an English image from the 1770s. And it shows him him holding under his arm a type of hat-like form, which actually is a barber basin. It's got a notch cut out of it. You would put that under your neck, and then when you're being shaved, it would fit well for the dripping soap. The, he's also holding up a folding razor in one hand, and then he has a raised hand with a type of knife that was used for bleeding people. If you bled them, let out a small amount of blood, that could let out some of the ill humors that might be making you sick. Here's an example of a barber bowl in the Winterthur collection, this one dating to right around 1700. It was made in England, and it has a lot of sort of unusual looking designs in the center of it. Those were meant to represent some of the different tools of the barber's trade. You can see at the upper left within the well of the dish, a needle and thread. Um, to its left is a hollow well in the edge of the bowl that was used to contain ball soap. And you can even see a circle there to show you this is where the ball soap goes. Another item from within the bowl is a folding razor. At the bottom of the well of the bowl, we can see a type of comb. The center of the bowl has a pair of wig curlers that are shown crossed. And at the top of the bowl, we can see a, an example of a type of shaving brush. And at the right is a pair of scissors. All of these would be being used by a barber. Now this nice bowl was made, as I said, in England around 1700, but there were many, many types available. Here we can see some other ceramic examples, a wonderful uh, Japanese porcelain piece at the upper left, dating to about the same time as that Delft bowl that we saw, and then a much later version at the lower right, which was made in China for a Portuguese nobleman. You also, if you wanted, could have bought a barber basin in metalwork. It could be in tortoise shell. It could be in horn um, or in other types of materials as well. The last of the objects I'm going to show you today is this wonderful, if somewhat worn, example that also is from the Winterthur collection. This is a barber bowl that was made by the Pennsylvania German community, and it has the date 1774. Around the rim, it also has an inscription that was obviously intended to make the person who was being shaved smile. It's inscribed, come sir and have the shave, which you no longer need to crave. 
So on that note, I'm going to be leaving this PowerPoint. And I'd like to just wish you well and hope that you stay healthy and don't need any of the medicines that I've mentioned to you today. And that I get to have you come and visit me at Winterthur sometime in the not distant future. Goodbye for now.